Good evening. I think we just met. Last night, it was given to us that we are not to seek the improvement, the change, the healing, the reformation of any part of the human picture, but that we were to seek within ourselves for the revelation of spiritual being, spiritual creation, spiritual reality, and this actually is known to us as the middle path. The middle path meaning this, that over here you have good health and over here you have bad health. In the human picture, the natural inclination is to change the bad health into good health or the lack into abundance or the sinfulness into purity. But on the spiritual path, you ignore the evil humanity and you ignore the good humanity and you go down this middle path of realizing spiritual identity. In other words, you take no thought for your life. That means for your personal sense of life. You can take thought for God's life, which is yours, but you can't take thought for your life, for its health, or for what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or wherewithal you shall be clothed or housed. In other words, you shall take no thought for your life, or your patient's life, or your student's life. What shall you do? Seek the realm of God's life. And so it is that when you are called upon for help, whether for yourself or another, you don't sit down and think of the human identity of the one who has asked for help or the one you desire to help. And you do not pray or do mental work to change their lives, their bodies, their health, their supply. But what you do is you ignore either the evil circumstance about them or the desired good circumstance. You ignore both and you mentally go down the middle path of God realization. To know thee aright is life eternal. Certainly it would be life eternal for me or for my patient or my student just to know the aright. And so now I must think not of my patients or my students or my family's good health or bad health. I must begin to think of God as their life, God as their being, God as the substance of all creation, God as the creative principle, God as the only law. Well, you know that with almost every claim that comes to an individual, there is a sense of law, some material law, some mental law, some moral law, some legal law, but you ignore these and go right down the middle path of spiritual law. And you don't try to change bad material law into good material law. You don't try to uh, nullify a mental law or establish one. You ignore material and mental laws and go right down the middle of 
spiritual law. And you do it by realizing this. Always you begin everything with the word God. Now if God is spirit and God is the lawgiver, then all law is spiritual. Well, then you say, what about the law of infection or the law of contagion or the law of karma? Well, to tell you the truth, there are no such things in the spiritual kingdom. They only exist and operate in what is called this world. In other words, you would find... And those of you who have ever read Oriental literature already have found that the law of karma, which is supposed to operate in human experience, does operate in human experience, comes to an end the moment you have reached that place of God consciousness or samadhi. In God consciousness, there is no karma operating. Ah, then you will find that in your life as a human, there is always karma operating. You are always either paying the penalty for the wrong things you were taught, or you are benefiting by the right things you were taught, or you are always paying a penalty for your sins of omission or commission, or you are being rewarded for the good that you have done. This is all karma. But the moment you leave this world for my kingdom, which is the middle path, and begin to realize your identity as consciousness, as the Spirit of God made manifest, the life of God made manifest, you are now elevating yourself into a state of consciousness which is spiritual and in which no karma operates. Now, you can live on this earth in such a manner that a minimum of karma operates in your life. I doubt that anyone can rise totally above some form of karma in their experience because karma includes not only the uh, rewards or punishments for their own deeds, but also the evils that come upon us by what we call race consciousness or universal belief. And therefore, to some extent, karma must operate. Uh, when the atomic bomb was thrown on Japan, every American citizen anywhere on the face of the earth became a victim of that karma. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. That which you do to another must be visited upon you. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And there is only one way in which any American can separate himself from that karma. And that is, if in his heart and soul he can really say, I not only disapprove of it, but I would rather have it fall on me than on them and mean it, and actually mean it. And in that does he become separated from the karma of that experience. Otherwise, every citizen must share the guilt not because it was done with his approval, but because he didn't voice any disapproval. Now, 
It is in this same way that the citizens of every country are under a karma for the misdeeds of their government, just the same as they are under good karma for many of the good things that their nation has been responsible for. But the one way to become separated from both the good karma and the bad karma is to lift oneself in consciousness to the realization of one's sonship in God and one's complete dependence upon the source of his being and thereby be an instrument of blessing to his nation and to every nation without seeking to benefit and not desiring to suffer. In the same way, there is a medical law of infection and contagion. Now, regardless of what country you live in, you are under that karma of the medical belief in infection and contagion until you as an individual take the middle path and remove yourself from that by your conscious realization of God as the only lawgiver. And therefore, since spirit is the only lawgiver, the only law is spiritual. And as you refuse to accept medical law, material law, as being law, you actually remove yourself from its operation. Now, it'll only take two minutes to prove this to you. If you have ever had a cold or grip or flu, or if you have ever had rheumatism or arthritis, and have been healed by a metaphysician, you have proven that the law of infection, contagion, weather, or climate isn't law at all. Because that law which gave you the cold, the grip, the flu, the rheumatism, the arthritis, is still operating in consciousness, but you are no longer a victim of it. You have been healed. You have been brought out from under that particular karma. Now, those who have been healed by some practitioner without knowing what this truth is that did it, of them the master says, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. In other words, if you do not know how and why you were healed, there's no reason why you can't get sick again next week or next year or five years from now. Because you have not removed yourself from that karma, you have been removed by the consciousness of your practitioner, but you can't count on your practitioner marrying you. They can't live with you forever. And therefore, when they go away, you better see to it that the comforter comes to you. And so it is. That is the reason, incidentally, that many people have had wonderful healings through metaphysical help. And in some cases have had a return of the same complaint. In other cases, they have had other things even worse than the one they were healed of. But you are always cautioned. Remember, you have been healed through an activity of truth in my consciousness but go now and sin no more. In other words, don't go back to the very belief 
that trapped you come out from among them and be separate. In other words, ye shall know the truth. Not only your practitioner, but ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And the truth that you have to know is not that you know some way to cure a cold or grip or flu or arthritis, because none of us do. We know nothing about the healing of physical disease, but we do know this, that God is infinite. And God is spirit, therefore, spirit must be infinite. And if spirit is infinite, all law, all substance, all being is spiritual. If it's spiritual, you have nothing to fight, nothing to contend with, nothing to overcome, nothing to destroy. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, we are not improving humanhood in a spiritual teaching. What we are doing is revealing spiritual identity, your spiritual identity, your pure spiritual sonship, divine sonship, your relationship to God. But the result of that is, of course, a harmony that is made manifest in human affairs. Now, for quite a few centuries, it has been taught that the spiritual way of life is impractical. It has been taught that you cannot live the spiritual life in this world and get along. But uh, in this last century, that has been disproven many times, and more so today, and I uh, must rejoice that my attention was called to the fact that Mr. Cabot Lodge, on accepting the nomination for Vice President of the United States, said in his acceptance speech that the time is coming when we will settle all of our problems spiritually. Ah, uh, evidently, it's no longer impractical Evidently, it is commencing to seep into consciousness that you can set all the problems of your physical, mental, moral, and financial health and human relationships spiritually. It was my pleasure on my last trip to Chicago to have personnel directors representing 25 large corporations come to me for instruction in how to apply these principles in big business. Ah, we are beginning to solve our problems spiritually. I have four times had the opportunity of working on strikes in corporations and witnessing them ended within 24 hours. And it was only called in when there was no hope of them being settled by any human means. It is being recognized that it is possible to solve our problems spiritually, but you must understand what this means. It does not mean praying to God to solve them for you. It means knowing the truth. It does not mean asking God to do you a favor or to do something for you that you hope God isn't going to do for the other side. It isn't anything like that. There's nothing spiritual about that. The spiritual way of life is the absolute knowledge and conviction of God as spirit and of God as omnipotent, that means all power. Not a power to be used because if God is all power, there is no other power. 
for God to be used upon. When you understand that, you do not fight with dictators or labor leaders, nor do you pray to God to punish them either or remove them. You sit in quietness and in confidence right down the middle path. God alone is. Beside God there is nobody and nothing for God is infinite. And being infinite there is nothing outside of infinity. Then when you come face to face with the fact oh here is greed, lust, animo animosity, jealousy, you don't begin to treat those. You recognize the source of those. You will find in the writings that the source of all error is that which has been termed the carnal mind or the mortal mind but that the nature of the carnal mind or mortal mind is a universal belief in two powers and that's all that constitutes mortal mind. There is no such thing as a mortal mind and there is no such thing as a carnal mind. There is a belief, a universal belief in two powers, good and evil. And this belief constitutes mortal mind or carnal mind. And therefore, you don't have to fight carnal mind and you don't need a God to fight it for you. You have only to know right down the middle path. Thou couldst have no power unless it came from God because God is infinite power. And then you don't fight carnal mind, you drop it. You drop it. The moment you fight an error, you make nothingness a reality. You have then an image and thought as if you had built up a ghost and then started struggling with your mind to get rid of a ghost that isn't there. You must come on this middle path to the realization of the spiritual reality as the only reality and then don't fight the material or the mental. But realize their nature as merely an image in thought. A universal one that has come to you through race consciousness for acceptance. In the same way, the devil came to Jesus. Did a devil come to Jesus? No, there aren't any devils. But the race belief in a devil presented itself to him as if it had the power to do good for him. And incidentally, that too is where many metaphysicians fall down. They're on their guard always for the devil appearing as some form of evil. And they recognize that as devil right away. But when the devil comes in the form of something that looks good to them, they are not quite so uh, quick to recognize it as the devil. They're more apt to believe it's spiritual demonstration. In this work, I have witnessed more people harmed by the prosperity that has come to them through their study than I've ever seen harmed by lack or limitation. They always recognize lack and limitation as being a temptation to swerve from God, 
But somehow they always think of a lot of money as just being poured out by God and uh, then forgetting that it isn't. It isn't. The human good isn't any more spiritual than the human evil is evil. It is only when you go down the middle path and realize God as the source that prosperity doesn't harm you. Because then money is just something here, even if it's piled up, it's just something you take out and use as the occasion may require or give or share or spend but there's no sense of attachment to it as if it were your master and you its servant. But sometimes money can harm not because money has any power because of the power we give it and instead of just treating it as it should be treated as a very necessary part of our experience that which must come and that which must go and that which must remain when we center our attention down here on the spiritual things of life then it makes no difference how much we have there's no evil in it but on the other hand it doesn't make a difference how little we have there's no evil in it because our lives are not being lived in little or much but so we go from that to health more spirituality is developed through disease than through health why we recognize evil as a we recognize disease as an evil and we bend every effort to rise higher in spiritual consciousness when we have health we just sit back and take it for granted and think oh this is spiritual i'm all right and it may not be spiritual at all it may just be a physical manifestation of temporary health and so in that sense of good temporary health we just rest and relax and enjoy it instead of continuing our spiritual search for deeper realization deeper awakening now the point that we have here for us tonight is this not merely that we must not give our attention to changing ill health to good health or lack to abundance but also that we must not rest content when we are healthy or wealthy or when we know others who are healthy or wealthy but that in both cases we must be able to look down this middle wall and say i know thee who thou art thou art spiritual you are neither sick nor well you are neither rich nor poor you are heir of god joint heir to all the heavenly riches of health and wealth and harmony and goodness and so forth in other words do not allow yourself to become attached to the human scene do not allow yourself to become attached to merely desiring to get rid of the negative in order to get the positive but ignore both take no thought for your life as you look down here and witness god's life and your spiritual sonship this actually is one of the highest spiritual unfoldments that has ever come to earth it has its basis in the master's revelation that my kingdom is not of this world and isaiah you know saw the same vision he said see she from man whose breath is in his nostril for where is he to be accounted of and he wasn't speaking only of sick humans whose breath is in their nostril or poor ones he was just saying cease ye from men whose breath all men and bear witness to their Christ to it 
In this way, you find that you are living in the middle path. You are always living. Oh, not completely, but in a measure, and some part of every day probably completely, you are living in this middle path in which you are not giving too much reality to whether it's sick or well today, but always to that spiritual path. And then this reveals to you one of the important points that must be known in this particular age in which we are living. Most of the world, reading in the papers or hearing on the television, about these troubles that we're going through in Africa and Russia, or down in the southern states of the United States, really believe that these are evil conditions and that we're going through a period of evil. And I don't know how they possibly... Well, yes, I do. From a material standpoint, I suppose you're always believing in appearances. But those on the spiritual path must surely know that these aren't the evil days. These are the good days. These are the days of the breaking up of evil. These conditions that we're going through today are the breaking up of the evils that have existed. Certainly, they're evil while we're going through them. They're terrible to go through. But you will find that they're not evil. These represent the end of evil. In other words, with every situation that is before us today, you will find that when it's solved, there will be a greater sense of brotherhood, of man's humanity to man, of cooperation, and so forth. I'm thinking, just to use it as an illustration, that in our southern states of the United States, in 1866, the Negroes were given their political freedom. Well, at least that's the way the law reads. But you will notice that in 1960, a law is being passed again, giving them the freedom that they were given in 1866. Why? Because they didn't get it in 1866. No, they're just now coming into it. And what has brought that about? Strikes, sit-downs, riots. And you read the papers and you say, oh, what terrible conditions are going on in the South. They're not terrible conditions. They are the breaking up of terrible conditions. They are the righting of wrongs. And the end will be the Negro will be permitted education. He will be permitted culture. He will be entitled to equality. He can't have social equality while he's educationally and culturally inferior. But remember, he's only that because of lack of opportunity. And as we have discovered, when a Negro becomes educated, when he is exposed to culture and refinement, he becomes just exactly as we are. You must remember, the world has gone through the same problem with the Hebrew race. In how many places were the Hebrews hated and despised and looked down upon, and you may say justifiably so, only because of ignorance, lack of education, lack of culture, and then look as the passing centuries came and uh, Holland and England first opened their doors to the Hebrews and gave them their first freedoms only a few centuries ago. And then witness that as these centuries have passed and then finally we come up to where a Hebrew is prime minister and a Hebrew is governor of states 
and a Hebrew is the great scientist, and so forth and so on. Why? Only because he has been permitted education, culture, refinement, equality, eventually. Now, do you not see that while the pogroms of the Middle Ages must have been looked upon as terrible ordeals for the Hebrews, can you not see that those very things were the breaking up of the evils of ghettos and the beginning of their freedom? And so you are going to behold someday that at this very moment, Christ, the Spirit of God, is operating in human consciousness to bring about a breaking up of the evils that have been hidden under a crust and that this activity of the Christ will operate in human consciousness overturning and overturning and overturning until he come whose right it is and who is that he? Christ recognized as you and as me. In other words, that moment that was spoken of last night, in which we realize that there is but one God, the Father in heaven, a spiritual Father. And therefore, we are all brothers. But not only we who are in this room, but we who are on this earth. We are all members of one spiritual household. And you will see that just as sometimes the Christ operates in our individual consciousness and uh, deprives us, it would seem, of health or of supply, but not for punishment or evil purposes, but only as a breaking up of a crystallized evil that must be dissolved. And so it is. As long as we have reliance on material modes and means of living, we are under the necessity of making a transition to a spiritual dependence. If we have too much belief in medical law, health laws, economic laws, we must gradually make the transition to the realization of spiritual law as being the all and only law. If we as students do this, we will find that there will be no need for us to have these flare-ups and breakouts, such as we find in the world today. We will make the transition normally. But if we persist in our materialism, then as the Christ touches our consciousness, it causes eruptions. And sometimes they're eruptions of health. Sometimes there are eruptions in our family life or in our economic life, our business life, or social life. So it is that we must be prepared to make the transition from the universal belief in material and mental laws to the recognition of spiritual law as the only law. We must make a gradual transition from the belief that you and I have lives of our own. And some of those lives are 20 years and some of them are 80 years. You have to make a transition from that because there's trouble in either one of those. It makes no difference whether you're talking about 20 years or 80 years. There's trouble in it because the world was leading to something else. The transition must be made in our consciousness that God is our life. And therefore there is no such thing as years connected with our life. There is only eterni eternity and immortality. But 
that must be a gradual transition that takes place through a daily communion with truth, through a daily period of meditation in which we ponder the spiritual law of health one day, we ponder the spiritual law of life another day, we ponder the spiritual law of supply another day, we ponder or meditate upon the spiritual law of relationships another day, and each day we take some subject into our consciousness and we ponder it and meditate upon it and we ask God for light on it. There is no greater way of being spiritually taught than to go within to the Father. You will find that even though at first you may not get answers or you may not get answers that you recognize, you will find that if you persist, you will reach the day when you will never need to do anything but turn within and say, Father, what about this? And instantly receive your answer, your guidance, your direction, whatever it is that may be necessary. But this too comes from a living in the middle path, a realization of this. There are no laws out here acting upon me for good or for evil. There are no laws external to me operating upon me for good or for evil. Why? Because I am life eternal. I am the law. I, that part of me which is God, the kingdom of God within me, this is the source of life, the source of law, the source of supply, the source of health, and therefore it never comes to me, it flows out from me. Therefore, there must be a period of meditation each day in which we realize the kingdom of God is within me. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. All that the Father hath is within me. God has given me dominion over the earth, and the air, and the skies, and the water beneath the earth. God's dominion, God's grace is my sufficiency. Not my dominion, not my grace, God's dominion in me. God's grace in me is my sufficiency, and it is within me. I do not pray for it to come to me. I pray for it to be revealed as flowing forth from me. Open up a way, open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape. That which I am seeking, I am. All that the Father hath is embodied within me. God would never send forth an offspring without the full and complete equipment for life. And therefore, each one of us has the fullness of God qualities, the fullness, the completeness of God qualities, but we must open out a way. We must first recognize that God's good is established in my consciousness. I and the Father are one, and all that the Father hath is mine. I of my own self am nothing. And then, by performing the work that is given us to do each day, and without any desires about what the next day shall bring forth, but performing that which is given us to do, and not even that without realizing that it is God in me, the Spirit of God in me, the Christ in me, that performeth that which is given me to do. Doing that and taking no concern for my life or my well-being, I find that the recognition of this invisible presence and law 
is always out before me performing that which is given me to do, perfecting that which concerneth me, preparing mansions for me, making the crooked places straight, but then not for me. Not for me. God does nothing for me. God is doing it and I am benefiting because of my awareness of that law. And that is why when we come to this wonderful subject of gratitude, be sure that you are grateful every day for the crops in the ground and the gold and the silver and the diamonds and the pearls in the sea. Grateful that the stars and the sun and the moon are in the sky and under the jurisdiction of God. Grateful for the sun and the rain. Grateful because God hasn't given this to you. God has given this to us. We are all beneficiaries of God, but only those seem to come into the actual experience of it who have some measure of awareness of it. As long as you do not personalize God, you are on safe ground. As long as you do not believe that God is favoring you or favoring me, you are on safe ground. As long as you are grateful, not for the food on your table, but as long as you are grateful for the food that God grows and that God has made for mankind, you are on safe ground. In the same way that you are on safe ground when you do not personalize evil. Do not for a minute believe that evil has come to you. Do not believe that evil has come to another. Do not believe that you are evil or that anyone else is evil. Recognize always that evil is an impersonal sense. And we call it the carnal mind or nothingness, the arm of flesh. And as you impersonalize it, you will come to that place where spiritual healing is not difficult. Now many people find spiritual healing difficult and the reason is they're trying to heal you or me. And they're trying to remove evil from us. And we haven't got any. Know ye not that you are children of God? Know ye not that you are the temple of God? Know ye not that your body is the temple of God? So there's no evil in you. None, and never has been. Nor in anyone else. And to be able to heal spiritually, this is the first principle that you must know. You must know when anyone requires help that you're not to give them a treatment. You are merely to know that all evil is universal belief, carnal mind, is not personal and therefore isn't a person and hasn't a person in whom, on whom, or through whom to operate. And as you impersonalize it, you'll find that your patient is free. Or you yourself become free. It is very much like, well, we can start with uh, a dog, a pet dog. If you make a practice of saying bad dog, bad dog, bad dog, naughty dog, unruly dog, dirty dog, you know right well what you are going to get eventually from that dog, and you are. If you can take an opposite attitude and never blame the dog, never put responsibility on the dog for the error, but realize that whatever the nature of this dog, this discord is, the dog isn't responsible and it isn't because he didn't go to church and it certainly isn't because he didn't read my books. No, there is an impersonal reason for it for which he is not responsible. And as you know that, 
you lift the responsibility of guilt from that dog and the first thing you know you've got a good dog and a healthy dog but I must tell you that that's true of us too and I know this from my experience in prison work when you go into prison and realize that there isn't an evil man there not one there are only men there suffering from having accepted the belief of evil and the judges and the juries believe they were evil too maybe even their parents believed it sometime but the fact of the matter is they are not evil and never were and when you go into the prison with that realization and begin to see that all of this evil of which they were guilty was actually the carnal mind which they didn't have enough knowledge to nullify you'd be surprised what begins to happen with those men and you'd be surprised when you witness them quickly being released and paroled and you'd be surprised further when you hear from wardens that they never come back now the whole thing lies not in what you can get God to do because you can't get God to do anything whatever God is doing God is doing without any help from you and without any advice and without any petition you can't make God do anything and you can't influence God to do anything and so there's just no use of trying to bring God down to earth leave God where God is and know this truth that God is performing God's work just as God is bringing the sun moon and stars around in their time and the tides God is performing all that God is supposed to do and then realize that all of the evil that is upon this earth whether it is in your individual experience or that of another all of this represents but that belief in two powers that carnal mind that arm of flesh or nothing and be sure that you impersonalize it and then you bear witness to how the world begins to treat us differently how we begin to act differently to the world how the evils of this world begin to miss our dwelling place instead of stopping off there regularly none of the evils will come nigh my dwelling place the 91st Psalm tells us if I abide in the secret place of the Most High what does that mean abiding in the secret place of the Most High live in the middle path don't live halfway between good health and bad health and wanting to change one for another don't live halfway between lack and abundance and trying to change one into another dwell in the secret place of the Most High where you are tabernacling with God and you are realizing God's spiritual nature the spiritual nature of God's law of God's man of God's being and then when you do face an appearance of evil drop it with a realization this is mortal mind or carnal mind or the arm of flesh or nothingness this is something that was not ordained of God and has no life of God or law of God to support it or sustain it and then you'll find yourself living not under the karma of medical law theological law well you know that a great deal of our trouble is caused by, caused by theological law it has most of the world living in a guilt complex I have been shocked at times to hear some of the hymns that are sung in prisons all about my sins and my punishments it's horrible to listen to them I, don't wonder, I wonder that those uh, prisoners don't rise up and say send me to a healthier atmosphere than this where there isn't so much sin and punishment can't we find a God somewhere who is love 
who might forgive me my sins, who might not be holding me in condemnation and punishment. Ah, that would be too much to expand, express that Christianity. Now, let us understand this. Do not live in any sense of condemnation to anything on the human plane because that is perpetuating it. The only way to become free of the evils of this world is to recognize God's law, God as dwelling place, God as life, God as substance, God as being, and then sum everything else up, whether it's material law, medical law, theological law, weather law, climate law, sum it all up as carnal mind or the arm of flesh or nothingness. Now, in summing this up, you must realize that all of this means that you are not to fight evil, nor are you to try to get God to do something to it for you. You are to recognize the nature of evil in any and every form as impersonal and therefore as nothing. Impersonal means without person. And if it's without person, there it is. Where was the devil when it tempted Jesus? Well, it seems to have been standing in front of him. But where was the devil when he said, get thee behind me? We don't know because it just disappeared. In other words, it didn't exist as an entity or an identity. It existed only as an image and thought. And so it is that every temptation that is offered us is but an image in thought which we are to recognize as temptation and then dismiss it. Recognize it as temptation. Recognize it as an image in thought. Recognize it as devil or carnal mind. And then be off because it is a nothingness. The middle path does not seek to change our humanhood. The middle path seeks to bring to us the awareness of our Christ identity. The middle path does not seek to change human conditions. It seeks to reveal the kingdom of God on earth. The middle path, the mystical path, is not one that concerns itself with finding a power with which to heal disease or overcome sin or poverty. The middle path or mystical path is a realization of the spiritual nature of your being and of all creation. It is, in fact, an ignoring of what seems to be human conditions. And the Master said, resist not evil. And he didn't mean resist it not and let it overcome you, but resist it not in the realization of God's presence God's power as the only presence and the only power. You must see that in this message of the infinite way you are witnessing an unfoldment and a revelation of the middle path which is a continuous realization of God. And as you stay in the middle path, not concerning yourself for the momentary conditions 
of human good or evil, and yet being in this world and performing every task that is given to you to the utmost of your ability, you will then find that gradually you will witness what will appear to us as improved human conditions, improved health, improved supply, improved purity, but which will not be that at all. It really will be our Christ self in manifestation, our Christ self brought to individual expression. And then we will realize that as a matter of truth, we never were human beings. We were always spiritual being with the mask of humanhood covering us up. That is the word for personality, persona, mask. And our human identity is but a mask which covers up our true identity which is Christhood or spiritual sonship. As you understand that then, you will be able to resist not evil. You will realize that you are being faced with a mental image and thought, an illusory picture, which seems real only to our material senses. The more you abide in the presence of God, consciously in the presence of God, the less real will the material picture seem to be to you. Now in this work that we have had this evening, we have taken a very big step forward in transition from entertaining even in our own thought an idea of improved humanhood through this work to where we can now consciously realize at least for a moment or two every day Christhood is the measure of my being and of yours. Thank you.